Hi, everybody, and welcome to U.S. Farm Report. On this week's show, we'll be visiting with Mr. Philip Wilkie, son of the famous Wendell Wilkie, who in 1940 opposed Franklin Roosevelt in the race for the presidency of the United States. We will also be talking with Harry Canfield, who is a grain marketing representative out of the Boise, Idaho marketing area. My special studio guest, is my good friend and colleague, Phil Allen, veteran farm news analyst, who for NFO currently is broadcasting on some 600 radio stations across the country with three shows on each station each week. And mathematically, Phil, that almost, that almost astounds me. What does it all amount to? Well, it sort of astounds me, too. There are mm. 1,700 programs a week. and. Uh, on 600 stations, that's not quite each one carrying it three times. Yes. But some stations carry all three. These are five-minute programs, and they're scheduled when the stations want to schedule them. I rather imagine they're mostly heard on noon hours and on breakfast mm -hmm. hours, whenever farm audiences are usually cultivated. The shows are called, quite appropriately, Here's Alan. Yes. Phil, uh, what kind of subject matter will you be dealing with on our show? Well, my beat has always been to cover the stories that are interesting to farmers who believe in collective bargaining. Now, this uh, runs quite a gamut. We sometimes talk about the spread between the grocery store price and the farmer's price. Mm -hmm. We talk about such matters as, well, the latest developments in collective bargaining in various departments. For instance, when uh, uh, new contracts are being ratified, say, in the cattle contract, we cover that. Mm -hmm. And then whatever the press is saying about agriculture. Uh, I guess the simplest way to say it, if, if I believe in the craft, is whenever it's news to farmers, and I try to talk about it. Phil, of course, we saw each other at convention. I guess we ran into each other, passed each other in the hall a couple of times, like ships in the night. We were both very busy. I haven't had a chance to talk to you since, so I'm anxious to know about your reaction to the 1970 NFO convention in Louisville. Well, many of the people that I talked to, and I expect you heard this too, were saying that this was the best convention in years. I did hear that. It was, uh, I think it, w it was that for quite a number of reasons. NFO has put together some pretty sophisticated machinery for mm -hmm. bargaining. Mm -hmm. And as, uh, well, the press picked up as the big news story out of the convention, the fact that these lift operations were going to get underway uh, shortly after the first of the year, as Orrin Lee Staley said it in his main address to the convention, in dairy, meat, and grain. And then uh, I noticed that there was quite a response from the delegates when he gave the, well, described the NFO's attitude toward the law. He said, we believe in the laws of this country, but if it t requires peaceful demonstrations to get these lift actions underway, we'll have them. Mm -hmm. And then there was a big response from the delegates. Yes, there was a response. And then he said, if it's necessary for us to have uh, general all-out holding actions, we'll have them. And that brought the delegates up out of their seats with one of uh, what I felt was one of the big ovations mm -hmm. of the convention. Mm -hmm. uh, we had distinguished guests, as we always have, a Republican senator and a Democratic senator. Senator Marlowe Cook of Kentucky was the Republican, and Senator Harold Hughes of Iowa, the Democrat. There were a number of other guests, uh, Philip Wilkie and uh, uh, Frank LaRue, Mm -hmm. the Agriculture <clears throat> Department official who resigned in protest in the 1960s and has written the books to the farmers yes. worst five years, seven years, and nine years. Now, you interviewed Philip Wilkie, did you yes. not? Yes, I understand you did, too. Yes, I did. In fact, uh, I found him to be a most uh, enthusiastic uh, opponent of uh, the corporate conglomerations. I'm sure he discussed that with you, Phil, when you talked with him. 
Yes, he showed me some of the clippings from Indiana newspapers about what he described as an early skirmish he'd mm -hmm. had mm -hmm. with uh, bank holding companies that wanted to acquire fully owned subsidiary banks, or yes. in other words, gobble up the little banks. And he has a lawyer's savvy, just as his father had, about a fight. Yes. He said, uh, I think he was quoted in the Wall Street Journal, as uh, saying, I'm going to raise enough hell that they'll know they've been in a fight. <laughs> All right, why don't you uh, sort of eavesdrop uh, on Phil, Philip Wilkie and me as I talked with him uh, late one night uh, in a motel adjacent to Freedom Hall in Louisville, Kentucky. Love to. Is your mother still in, uh, in uh, New York? Yes. Mm -hmm. She's moved a couple of times since then over yes, the years. But she's in good health. And well, yes, yeah, she's 80 years old. Is she that old? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, well, she seems tired. Uh, I've noticed that more in the last 90 days. Yeah, yeah. But I guess when you're 80 years old, you get tired. Sure, I think you must. <laughs> uh, Philip, how did you happen to get into Indiana? Well, we always went back and forth out there a lot, and, and uh, uh, I liked it out there. And, and the father talked about it. You know, I'd be independent. Why yeah. don't stay in Wall Street, go back out there to the hinterland somewhere. <laughs> right. And uh, so I guess I've... Uh, and I think this is uh, probably you know, not a factor at this point. I don't want to make any issue. I would make it too personal. But we got going on this. Is I think I've got a good argument that after all, I went back. I didn't have to. I'm not there by necessity. I'm there by choice. Yeah. I went back, and then the very independence. I went back to see. I see now I'm being lost to conglomerates. Now I think that's. I don't want to make that in this show. I don't think I. You know, if I. Well, we're really, making the show right well, now. Well, no, so no. Let's talk about that. Well, I'd be glad to talk about that. Um, um, I went back because I liked it as a youngster there because you could be free and independent. Right. Now, this is Rushville, Rushville. Indiana, right? where you uh, uh, are born, in the banking business and you're also uh, practicing uh, law there. Law. Yes. Well, we have been led to believe, Philip, that the huge conglomerates provide additional goods and services, but you say this is basically not true. Well, let me give you another example. In Canada, where we only have, they only have 10 banks, in the rural areas, they'll have the banks open maybe three hours only once a week. The same thing is true in the Outer Islands in Hawaii. Now, we have independent banking, you gotta stay open or you lose your customers. <laughs> That's chain the truth. banking, uh, you can cut down on the services. The mom and pop grocery was wiped out a generation ago by the supers. And now we have no delivery service in groceries. None whatsoever. We have no credit service in groceries. It's all cash and carry. You have no help with the merchandise. You have you, you really you push the carts yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, for the older people, for sick people, or anybody like this, this is a great inconvenience. There's less service than you used to have. That's another example of it. In the Penn Central. They put the Pennsylvania together, which was running, with the New York Center, which was running. Now, neither one of them are really running. And they've said that February 1st, unless they get some government funds, they can't meet their payroll. Mm -hmm. Now, I took a ride on the Penn Central and Haven Division from New York City Grand Central Station out to Rye last spring, and the wheels came off the passenger car that I was riding on. Well, you, you can uh, you go here in Louisville, go down to the river, the Ohio River. There's a bridge from Louisville over Jeffersonville that they've now abandoned. Well, if they don't mean to give it some maintenance, that bridge probably fall in the high river and then they'll get the taxpayers to fish it out. Yeah. All right, you go over to Jeffersonville, uh, right over there on the Indiana side here from Louisville where we are, and you'll see the marshaling yards there where the equipment is deteriorating. Or you can look at the right-of-way. For instance, they tore up the right-of-way after the merger of the New York Center of Pennsylvania, the double track from Indianapolis, Cincinnati on the old Big Four Division. They did that on the main line, the St. Louis to New York division from Minneapolis to Richmond. Well, if we have an emergency, you've got a single track against a double track. So the conglomeration means that you have less real wealth. Uh, the, the, the real estate is going down, the equipment isn't being maintained, there aren't as many people on the payroll, your services are cut. So what, when you have these conglomerates, as far as the public's concerned, the public has a stake in the roadbed being maintained and the equipment being maintained and credit services and banks being open, uh, the public is really deprived of essential services to which it's entitled 
by the conglomeration of, of economic entities. Philip, what are some of the huge conglomerates you feel we should start paying some attention to and dissolve? Well, I, I, I'm the greatest one, of course, General Motors Corporation. I, I, I think that if you don't dissolve the General Motors Corporation and have a Cadillac company, maybe a Buick Pontiac Olds company, a Chevrolet company, a Fisher Body company, and Frigidaire company, and so forth, I think it's very possible that the day may come when we will not dominate automobile production in America. This, I think, is a very frightening thought. I think we don't get some real competition back in the automobile business that we could lose that position. And I think that part of industrial power is one of the things that really makes this country great. Uh, take this IT&T, International Telephone Telegraph. I think this is very significant as far as agriculture is concerned. They bought the Sheraton Hotel chain. They bought the Continental Baking Company. They bought the Hartford Fire Insurance, which insures a lot of the livestock. But just now, they've bought a large piece of the Danforth Family Foundation stock in the Ralston Piranha Company. Mm -hmm. The Ralston Piranha Company was the company that encouraged, again, they, a lot of the farmers to go in the chicken business, the broiler business, right across in southern Indiana here. Then they went the integration route and busted those same farmers that encouraged them in the chicken business. Mm -hmm. Vertical integration. Vertical integration. Now, President Staley said uh, uh, last night that the antitrust laws be amended, should be amended to prohibit that, and President Staley's right. Now then, what do you think of NFO and their approach to solving the ills of agriculture? Well, I think the NFO approach is, is the approach. Uh, I hope that the NFO can sell the Farmers Union and the Farm Bureau and the Grange and then the various production groups on this approach. If all agriculture would accept this conception, I think it would be a revolution in the whole price structure of agricultural products. Now, of course, the corporate approach is making inroads into agriculture, as you well know. We're getting the conglomerates in, in land holdings, in corporate farming. What do you think this is going to do in terms of the consumer, Philip? In the long run, it's going to be terrible for the consumer because if a few conglomerates get control of the production of food, it'll mean higher prices for food. This is, uh, this is what's going to happen. In fact, uh, I have heard some agricultural experts who share your opinion say that food today is the greatest bargain of all. Well, there's no question that food's the greatest bargain of all. And the American consumer and the American wage earner and the American labor union member has a vested stake in the family farm because it's much better to have the production of food spread in a great number of hands than to have them in a few conglomerate corporations mm -hmm. who will then scheme and conspire to raise the price. Well, it's very evident that you feel keenly about this corporate conglomerate uh, situation. Now, uh, NFO was most pleased that uh, you contacted them and asked to come to the convention this year in Louisville and speak to the convention. And they have been extremely pleased in having you here. Well, I'm delighted to be here. I think this is a great crowd. They have a lot of verve, a lot of vitality. They're dedicated, they're inspired, they're militant. And this is what I think it takes. Let me ask you about Philip Wilkie, the man. Uh, you're the son of a most famous father. Uh, your father, Wendell Wilkie, made the run for the presidency in 1940, at which time you told me you were about 20 years old. How did you feel about this, and has this had any effect on your adult life? Well, you know, it, it was the most exciting time, and I've always been proud of him, and proud of the record that he made, and the contribution that he gave, which he gave himself, and the heritage that he left me. As far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, it, it, it's opened doors, and. Uh, provided opportunities that wouldn't have otherwise been there. Sometimes you don't always receive uh, some credit that maybe you ought to have for certain things, but uh, in the long run, uh, the pluses outweigh the minuses. Philip, you've been able to be your own man. Well, I see no problem of being your own man yes. just because you're the son of a famous figure. It doesn't worry me. Now, you said something that I found very interesting to me before we started uh, this uh, telecast, and that is that you do feel that there isn't one advantage, at least, in uh, having your name and your heritage, 
And that is that you can get some attention uh, when you start attacking the, uh, the conglomerates, for example. Well, you know, as Philip, say my name is Philip Smith, uh, lawyer and banker in Rashville, Indiana, I might have the same feelings <laughs> about conglomerates that I presently have, but uh, I wouldn't be able to uh, do some of the things that I've been able to do or would like to do or think that I can do. Mm -hmm. Philip, um, you know, it's easy for us to sit here and visit as we have about the problems and ills of the world and our nation, the conglomerates. We have people watching and listening. How can they help solve this, uh, this corporate conglomerate problem that you point well, out? Well, I think they insist on their congressmen and senators passing certain types of legislation. Number one, I don't think there should be any more tax-free acquisitions by corporations of banks of other corporations or banks. This is just strictly a matter of law. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, I think that we need a complete new law of franchising, uh, regulating the relationship between the franchisors and the franchisee. Uh, number three, I think, and this is very important as far as family farming is concerned, that no corporate conglomerate or any feed company should be allowed to be in the production of livestock. Uh, the, the Antitrust Act should be amended for that. Mm -hmm. President State made that point last night in his major speech. I think this is a, a very significant item. Now, number five, I think that no corporation should be allowed to purchase an, a corporation in another business in a non-related field. And I think those corporations which have non-related businesses should be forced to spend them off. And that's Philip Wilkie. They broke the mold, I think, <laughs> Phil, I should say. Uh, when they made Phil Wilkie. I think he has some of, the, some of the style and color of his father. He certainly does. In the way he talks. Yes. Yes, he's quite a fellow. I wish him well. Phil, did you have an opportunity to interview the governor of the Farm Credit Administration, Ed Janke? Yes, I did. He is a man of such stature that I heard it said of him that one day he is likely to be the Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, he, he, it seemed to me, Bill, that he's one of the easiest guys to interview that I've ever, ever done. He What's certainly the, is that. I'd like to ask you a question. When do you think is the best time to interview a speaker? Well, you know that uh, I think it's right after he makes a speech. Yes. And I know that you did that, and you're very wise to do it. Now, my schedule was such that I couldn't do it. I, uh, for example, with Ed Janke, who will appear, by the way, in a question and answer type program on U.S. Farm Report in the near future. Uh, I had to interview him uh, late one night. But even so, he was fresh and uh, alert yes. and uh, certainly most erudite and a marvelous man. I, I, I really respected him highly. Our routine at the convention was to hover sort of like vultures <laughs> right behind the speaker's platform. Yeah. And as soon as the speaker would address the delegate, then we'd grab him and take him up to the press room where they had a soundproof booth. Yeah. And my impression was that Janky, uh, well, he talked easily, and as you've indicated, he has full command of all the facts. And these are rather complicated matters he talked about. Phil, I consider that I have you as a captive audience on this week's U.S. Farm Report. Do you mind watching another one of my interviews Not made at, at a convention in Louisville? Uh, this gentleman you're about to see with me is Harry Canfield. He comes from Tree Mountain, Utah. He's a grain marketing representative. Works out of the Boise, Idaho marketing area. How big a farm do you have, uh, Harry? Oh, I run a 3,300-acre dry farm. Run 100 acres here. here. Yeah. Uh, you, you have some cattle, too? I run around 150 head of stock cows. Now you're a, a newcomer to NFO, really, aren't you? Since February of 1969. Uh, has NFO been organized uh, and chartered in uh, some of the uh, Utah counties for a long time, or is it fairly new there? No, it's fairly new. We have two counties that chartered now, and uh, we have membership in five or six more uh -huh. since then. What, what is the predominant uh, farming commodity in Utah, or is there any one? Well, uh, Wheat in our particular area uh, is the most, we raise more wheat in our county, mm -hmm. or these two counties possibly, and we do in the whole state. Yeah. Livestock is uh, uh, most predominant, I would yeah. say, over statewide so in, now, in uh, agriculture. What 
brought you to NFO, Harry? What attracted you to the organization? Well, the realization that we needed an organization that was nationwide and something pertaining to uh, collective bargaining, that we could pool our, our commodities together and uh, get a fair price out mm -hmm. of them. I suppose, Harry, that you, like so many other members of NFO, belong to farm organizations prior to joining NFO. Yes, I think this is the category that most farmers were in before NFO kind of uh -huh. became in existence. And you make an, uh, an interesting observation about NFO and membership in that organization as it pertains to other farm organizations. I'd like for you to make that observation for our viewers. Well, our membership uh, basically really comes from uh, members all of the other organizations, mm -hmm. the Farm Bureau and the National Farmer, I mean the uh, Farmers Union. In our particular area, these are the two strong ones. Uh, and many of them still belong to these organizations, but it's entirely a different situation. Ours is on, uh, the uh, National Farmers Organization is on uh, bargaining, blocking and bargaining on prices to get a surprise for our commodity. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of the others are based, basically, I would say, on legislation. Yes. And they all have done good in many respects. Harry, you are working as a grain marketing representative out of the Boise, Idaho marketing area. That's what right. is your job exactly? Well, my particular job is to market blocks of grain that are put together in this area, mm -hmm. in the Boise marketing area. In other words, the grain is put together in blocks and you go out and find a market for this grain. I do the marketing yes. on this or bargaining for this for this grain. Well, now, I would presume that somebody in your position is better able to talk about uh, marketing successes in that area than anybody. What have been some of your successes the past year? Well, a year ago, uh, I worked on a county level. Of course, uh, we didn't have an area representative at that time, mm -hmm. grain representative at that time. And I worked strictly in the county, Box Elder County in Utah. And uh, I would say that we, we moved between 60 and 70 percent of the wheat through NFO in our county. And since that time, I, of course, I have went with the National and uh, became an area representative of the Boise marketing area mm -hmm. on the grain. And we have been successful, very successful, in the last three months in moving uh, quite a, a large quantity of grain especially in the last 30 days. Where we were moving very little grain before, we have been moving a, a good supply. What do you find is the general attitude through your area on the part of the people to whom you market grain and on the part of, uh, of the grain producer who is a non-NFO member? Is is the, the attitude, the climate getting better all the time where NFO is concerned? Personally, I have always had real good relationship with the, uh, the user in our particular area, uh, having been in the grain business before. Mm -hmm. And I find this, that their attitude is this. They really don't care how much they pay for the grain as long as their competition uh, has to pay the same amount because their success or failure really uh, is determined on the competition of selling flour. Yes. And uh, if they, everyone is buying at the same price, they really uh, don't object to paying a farmer a fair price for his commodity, really. Is the user interested in a steady, dependable source? Definitely. This is important to Definitely. him, isn't it? They uh, were possibly skeptical towards NFO's ability to uh, deliver the wheat. But they have found out that we can deliver, and we do have the source of supply. And I find in most cases that it's, uh, we're pretty well accepted in our area. I think they have the feeling now that this possibly is the way the grain will be sold, and uh, we have been getting along very fine with them. We're in early 1971. What do you feel is the outlook for this year? For 1971? Yes. 
I think it's going to be a big year for NFO. For the simple reason, I think the chips are down as far as the farmer is concerned, and it's entirely up to him whether he, we succeed or whether we fail. And this might be his last chance. This is my personal feeling. The slogan of the 1970 National Convention of NFO was 1970. Uh, NFO, the farmer's last hope. Is, wasn't that it? I think just that's about it. it. That's just about it. And so uh, you seem to be supporting uh, that slogan when you say that this year, 71, um, might be the farmer's last opportunity to, to get the job done. Yes. And I, I might clarify this just a little, if I may. Uh, I think most farmers have found themselves in this situation. They have used up their equity in their inflated price of land. They have used up their depreciation in their machinery. And most of them are fairly close to the end of their credit on the open market, mm -hmm. on operating expenses. Well, now, we've either got to do one of two things. We've either got to throw in the towel or get enough for our commodity uh, expenses plus a profit or there's no place we can go. Now, I think a time has come when the farmer is going to himself is going to have to make up his mind which route he wants to take. If he'll take a good look at himself in the mirror, he'll realize, and be honest with himself, he'll realize that this is the only chance, the choice is really he has to make. It's either get a fair price for his commodity, that he can uh, pay his expenses plus a profit, because we do all have to have a profit to remain in business. It does help. I don't care whether we're large or whether we're small, eventually, uh, operating at the less the cost of production will get us all. And this, I think, is the, is the choice that a farmer has to make, and I think many farmers are beginning to realize exactly this. Phil, I want to thank you very much for being a guest on our show this week. It's been a pleasure. My special guest today in the studio, my friend and colleague, Mr. Phil Allen, veteran farm news analyst. Also, as guests, we featured this week on our show Mr. Harry Canfield of Tree Mountain, Utah, and Mr. Philip Wilkie of Rushville, Indiana. U.S. Farm Report is seen each week at this same time on this same station. Until we meet again, so long, everybody. <laughs>